You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than who was the person who invented milking cows, that question would have to be, Mark, can you do fine art self-portraiture with a half a megapixel Canon PowerShot 600 Digicam from 1996? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. Say hello to the power shot. Yes, he's a chunky boy, but let's not hold that against him. He's just big boned. Actually, no, he's not. In fact, all of this size is just free space and flab. It really doesn't weigh very much, uh, with most of the space actually taken up with room for a battery, memory card, and connectivity. This is Canon's first consumer digital camera. I use those words advisedly because of course it's not the first digital camera, probably not even Canon's first, it's just the first one pitched at regular people like you and me. Strap yourself into a time machine back to the mid 90s and imagine you're a real estate agent that needs to take photos of new properties you're putting up for rent, or you're doing safety inspections and you want to record hazards, or you're hosting an event and you want to take pictures of suits shaking hands for the company newsletter. Well, this would have been a dream machine. Now, my first exposure to digital photography wasn't with this one, but an Apple QuickTake. I started working in digital media around 1995 until I had a QuickTake in my hand. Uh, the first digital camera I ever saw was actually a huge Nikon SLR with a Kodak DCS digital camera back strapped to it. It was awe-inspiring, but it was expensive, not very practical, and actually not even very good. I remember when my daughter was born though, I borrowed an Apple Quick Take from work and took her first ever photos digitally. When she turned 21, I was trying to make a photo book and I realized I barely had any photos of her other than those that were taken with film and there weren't very many of them and her ultrasound. So I was desperate to find those VGA quality quick take photos. Unfortunately though, they're probably deleted or most likely lost to CD landfill over the years along with those copies of Microsoft and Carter. So sorry, Lizzie, you pretty much didn't exist for the first couple of years of your life until I could afford to buy my own digital camera, this impressive and beautiful Canon Ixus V and look at the size comparison. While not up to the impressive 2.1 megapixels of the Ixus, the Canon PowerShot actually represented a jump in resolution from the QuickTake to 832 by 608 pixels. So this was a true half a megapixel camera, which seems laughable now, but was a lot in 1996, considering the QuickTake models ran until 1999 and never went higher than 640 by 480. Its original price, the price for this was 128,000 yen and it sold in the US for $1,000. I got this for free, so a bit of a bargain. It came with all the manuals too and even included a docking station, but it lacked two things, a battery and any form of external storage. The first of these means that I either had to find a new battery online or forever give up on making this my everyday carry street photography shooter. I only found one place where I could get a replacement NB6N battery and at $65, that meant infinitely more money than I paid for it. The lack of external storage was much less a deal breaker though. First of all, it did have one megabyte of internal storage, which wasn't so much of an issue as it sounds, given that uh, a high resolution JPEG was only 500 to 1000 K. But the challenge was always going to be, how was I going to pull those images from the internal memory onto my computer. It uses a parallel port on the docking station and twain drivers to connect. And I really wasn't game to grab my old Mac SE out of the garage and try and get it working. It has one very neat trick up its sleeve though. And that is 
the fact that it uses PCMCIA Type 2 and Type 3 cards. Now, these were common adapters back in the day, particularly for connecting peripherals to laptop devices. And you could get a PCMCIA card, particularly a PCMCIA hard drive, and slot it directly in. Now, I don't have one of those, but what I was able to source was an adapter for Compact Flash. You remember Compact Flash? I still use them sometimes on my Nikon D70 and D700. So actually, um, I had a two gigabyte card hanging around and it slots straight into the PCA, the PCMCIA card like this, goes straight into the camera. I got one from China just at the time when my photo media tech at work was also able to dig up an old one that was lying around. So I have a camera, I have a card and I have power. And while I'm not exactly mobile, let's not forget all the professionals shoot tethered. And with this plugged into an extension cord, I could at least wander around the house and garden to take photos. The light was failing, but it gave me that chance to capture the beautiful Australian sunset. <laughs>
So I guess now you're waiting for a considered and unbiased view of the Canon PowerShot 600. Well, if that's what you're looking for, I strongly encourage you to check out Gordon Lang's Dino Bytes channel where he uses his decades of experience of reviewing cameras to give far more detail and critical insights than I can. If though, you're looking for an off the cuff and ill-informed opinion, you've come to the right place. Not that there's actually much to say, really. I mean, you've seen the results. Objectively, you're not going to be using this in 2023 to shoot your first child's birth or your best friend's wedding. Half a megapixel is small. The top of the camera has a button to select from three quality settings with 832 by 608 pixels at the highest through 640 by 480 and down to 320 by 240 pixels in economy. Almost useless now, but think about it, the quality of printers back then and SVGA was where the resolution of most monitors topped out. Otherwise, in many respects, is still a capable camera. No, you can't review the images after you've shot them, but that would drain the battery really quickly anyway. You can pose with an optical viewfinder that has frame lines etched in it, and it does have a macro mode, so yes, you can photograph flowers. It has a built-in flash that you can turn off. You can also force it on by holding the flash button on the front of the camera while shooting. It has a 50 mm equivalent f2.5 lens with a cover that slides out all the way when you turn it on and a focus distance of 40 cm to infinity in normal mode and 10 to 40 cm in macro mode. A couple of nifty features are the ability to record voice memos as well as shoot black and white text. This is a voice memo test of the Canon PowerShot 600 from about a foot away. This is a voice memo test of the Canon PowerShot 600 from about a foot away. One of the things I didn't realize until I read the manual was that one set of frame lines is specifically for photographing business cards. And it even has the word card at the bottom of the screen that goes red due to a physical filter that covers it when you put it into black and white mode. All reinforcing that this camera is a do anything business tool for those that don't care so much about quality, but where developing film is lost time and so lost money. Where it really gets clever is when you delve into the very cool but poorly implemented custom modes. Because guess what? This camera shoots raw. And that's a big deal because the JPEG compression on this thing is ugly. Take a look at this example and you'll see that there's a world of difference between the RAW and the JPEG in the sense that it goes from being horrible to just bad. I'd still argue it doesn't give you much flexibility when you have such low resolution, but it's better than nothing. To get to the RAW setting though, you have to cycle through a series of custom modes that includes two timers of either two or 10 seconds, depending on whether you need a delay or you're just putting on a tripod and you want to avoid camera shake. So quite a few options, but the reason why I say the custom mode is poorly implemented is because by paging through the options, you can select either of the timers or RAW, but I could not find a way to shoot RAW with a self timer. And why would I want to do that? Well, if I'm going to try and make fine art with it, surely I want to squeeze all of the quality out of that sensor. Since it's not exactly portable, I have to take pictures of myself. And don't you think this deserves to be rendered in all its delicate beauty? Okay, seriously, not the best subject matter, but I had to make the most of what was lying around the house. And if there's one thing that's always lying around the house, it's me. Yes, it was time to balance the limitations of movement, the limitations of the camera itself, and the limitations of this particular countenance by taking some self portraits. I knew that there was no way I was going to be able to capture my full complexity with just one photo. I mean, I'm multifaceted. 
even if I've been told that those faces max out at two. More importantly, since I don't have extendable arms, I had to use the self timer and that meant JPEGs not raw. Add to that the low resolution and it became clear that I was going to have to get creative by combining a series of images that at least tried to prove or provide glancing insights into the beautifully faceted diamond that is me. The project is called The Many Moods of Mark, and I'm going to take you behind the scenes as I rendered art with the Canon PowerShot 600. Okay, so here we have 12 candidates. Now, one of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about is that the color balance might be a little bit off with each of those. I'm not sure that I need to worry too much, um, but if the white balance is a little bit off, I might just, oh, a bit gray, but let's just do it that way. We will export these out, these new color balanced ones. Uh, we'll choose a different folder. I've already created a folder on my desktop called Multiple Me, and that is where they will sit. All right, we are going to Photoshop. And what we're going to do is we're going to automate using Contact Sheet 2. Now, I've already set the values in here, uh, 3328 by 1824. So what I'm going to do is a grid of uh, four images by three. That'll be my 12 images, obviously 300 pixels per inch. I'll be lucky if I can print at that, but we'll see. And what we're going to do is, um, I don't think I'll do auto spacing. Can I change those pixels to zero so that there's no gap? No, it doesn't want me to does not want me to do that. All right, so let's do that. We've got our folder, let's select my desktop, let's select multiple me, open there, and we will create a grid. We won't flatten the layers because I may need to adjust them a little bit once I've actually um, brought them all in. And there you go, a dozen me's, how exciting. All right, and actually they're all pretty well um, lined up. And I don't think there's too much that I need to do with that other than perhaps just move them a little bit. So um, what I might do is unlink these so that I can basically move the layer independent of the mask and I might zoom in a tiny bit and uh, straighten myself up so that I'm in the center of each individual image. So what we'll do is we'll go to uh, scale, and is that t command T? Yeah, and we'll just do that so that I'm kind of in the middle a bit. That looks good. Go to the next one. 
scale. So there you have the multiple versions of me. I still think the color balance is a little bit off, but we might be able to do something about that. What I'll now do is flatten the image. And now what I have to do is see if there's anything I can do to improve this, because if you start zooming in, you'll soon see that there's a whole load of artifacting going on and that it's not exactly, should we say the best quality. So what we'll do now is I'm gonna use a neural filter. I'm gonna to go to the filters, choose the neural filter, and let's see if we can remove some of this JPEG artifacting because of course I could not shoot in RAW. Let's turn that on, set the strength to high, and it's going to take a couple of minutes to process. How about we speed that up? and we're done so there we go has it made a difference well you tell me i think it has made actually quite a significant difference and if i zoom in you can see that it has definitely removed a lot of the jpeg artifacts what it has also done and actually it's really nice and clean around the edges this is actually pretty good but what it has also done i think is uh very much softened the image because of course one of the things about the jpeg is it would have applied sharpening to it but with all of that ugly jpeg wobbliness all right so let's leave that on click ok so now we have a version of the uh, picture with all of the jpeg rubbish removed not done yet though i'm going to save it now and i'll save it into the same folder and so here we are now back in lightroom and look it looks okay i think that there's a little bit of tweaking we can still do um i'm not a hundred percent in love with the wonky color balance and the, even though i did try and click on the white wall behind i don't think i really even the color balance out too much that's not too much of a problem though because i think what i might do is add my own special source and that will come through my favorite mark's quasi kodachrome setting and that'll lighten it up it'll sharpen it up i'll see if this one has some film grain in there because sometimes i do put film grain in there and i don't want there to be any film grain in this particular one that makes it a little bit cleaner a little bit sharp still but i think that that at least kind of evens out some of the color balance a bit is put that kind of slightly warmish tint against it to give you that kind of slightly orangey kodachrome feel um, this is my particular version of Kodachrome. You can see that um, I'm tweaking some of the process colors in there, but um, also if you go and have a look here, I'm changing the hue, saturation, and luminance to, I guess, drive it down to a few primary colors. Um, you can see there's plenty of orange in there. The reds tend to be a bit more muted in this one. And it gives me a nice filmic look. As I said, I sometimes apply grain, but I'm not going to do it here because I don't think it really works. I'm going to stick with it looking digital, but I'm going to try and improve things a little bit. If that sharpening that I've done, I'm not 100% convinced that I want that particular sharpening. Um, I might knock the sharpening down a tiny bit. And even, in fact, you know what? I'm gonna knock the sharpening down completely and I'm gonna sharpen it at the end. That looks a bit better to me. What I'm going to do is use another setting in here, which is the enhance option. And you'll notice one thing immediately is I do not have the ability to work with raw details. Now I'm working with a PSD and obviously it's an assembled image and that's one reason. But the other thing that you've got to realize too is that 
I don't know if it's an attribute of the CCD sensor, but it doesn't look like it has a Bayer array and certainly won't have X-Trans because that's a Fuji sensor array, but it doesn't recognize the CRW files as a raw file. And now what I should end up with is a larger file once it's finished processing. And that should give me something that I could even print. There we go. So if we go and have a look at what we have now, and while it looks a bit motley when I do it from a distance, I don't think it looks actually too bad as an image. But you know what I'm going to do? How about you tell me, do you think this would be best as color or black and white? I'm going to make it black and white. And where I often do is I'll often start with black and white landscape. And actually that already looks pretty good. So using black and white landscape as the basis for this, I think I can probably afford to bring in a little bit more, a little bit more gray in there. Go to curves and just perhaps bring the white a little bit because it's going to go against a white background. What I might do is lift up all of those high tones bring these ones back. There's a bit of vignetting that I should really have removed from the edges, but at the same time, I kind of like the separation that you get. So I'm not going to overdo it. I'm going to just do it that way. Perhaps add a bit more depth in there. And the other thing that you'll find is that if I'm going to be doing fine art, if you look at a painting, most paintings, even the darkest parts of a painting aren't black. They tend to be a dark gray. So to give it that sort of sensibility, you'll see up here that I've got no pure black. I've got no pure white. It's pretty much working. It's still quite contrasty and I could even probably bring the contrast down a little bit. But I think that that probably while just upping the exposure for my skin tones a bit, turning that down, they, I think, are our best options. And you can tell me which one you think is best. I do think that there's something very fine art about the black and white. But how about you tell me? And I'm done. So there you have it. The many moods of Mark. Now, subject matter notwithstanding, it took a bit of tweaking to get a usable image, but we're left with this psychological polyptic of one particular Renaissance person. Now, don't you just want this hanging up in your bedroom or toilet, particularly a work created with this magnificent relic of the early digital age. If I get enough demand, I'll set up a store and you can purchase one of these photos and then see 12 versions of me every day. If that's a bit too much for you, you can just choose to like, subscribe, share and ring that notification bell to get more irregular updates on YouTube. Later.